We still got some folks coming in here. We'll get started in about one minute. All right. Just waiting on the talent over here. Brad's getting everything right in the studio. You ready to go here? Going to have some mood lighting. Going on. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, let's kick things off. My name is Steve Kirschke. I have Brad Dexter in the studio. We have Don Terry and Laura Brown joining us remotely. And we have Anna Schaffert just rolling in right on time as well. She's uh, out and about doing some therapy, so we're just glad that she was able to make it on time. Welcome, Anna. We're just introducing you. Uh, for those of you who have been to and joined our webinars, welcome back. For those of you who are new, welcome to the QLI webinar series. We put these on every month or so, and we're really glad to be speaking about Acquiring New Skills After Spinal Cord Injury, and Brad and Anna are the experts today. They'll be talking about that. A little bit of housekeeping here. Uh, we're going to obviously provide some CEUs at the end of this. There's always questions about CEUs, so uh, we'll share what the process is going to be. Please refer to this as well. But uh, there's going to be a true-false question at the end of the presentation. Uh, we will call it out. It's a poll question. You just have to answer it. That's the first step. Secondly, uh, we will send an evaluation via email after this presentation. Usually uh, it's within, it'll definitely be within 24 hours, but we like to get it out a bit more quickly than that. And then as soon as you fill that out, uh, you will immediately receive uh, your CEU certificates and presentation slides as a PDF that is automatically sent via email once you submit uh, your evaluation. So that's the process. Some of you, uh, your firewall um, becomes challenging. Just email us separately. We'll make sure you get that. Uh, if you have other CEU questions, uh, let us know. But it's Don and I's goal someday to get through this without zero CEU questions. Don, do we think it's possible today? I feel good. I feel, I feel good. It's, I feel it's good. Wednesday and this, sunny. This is the group. Huh? I, I feel good. I feel like today's the day. And we, we need everyone's help. We have 145 participants and we're going to get it done today. So with that, Brad, kick us off. Awesome. Well, thanks for the introduction and um, glad to have Anna here with me as well. Um, we're going to go ahead and uh, just talk through the objectives really quick. So uh, we're going to talk through uh, what we call mantras of learning. And so I want you guys to be able to think about those, understand them, and, and ultimately be able to integrate them into uh, your practice, um, wherever you are, uh, I, being able to identify factors that limit new learning and skill retention after spinal cord injury. I think we're probably familiar with uh, some of those barriers or interferences that can pop up uh, in uh, in the course of rehab uh, for the individuals that we serve with spinal cord injury. Uh, also want to be able to uh, provide examples of complex new uh, spinal cord injury related routines that can be taught more effectively, and how to use learning techniques, how to integrate those into that, um, and then how, be able to discuss how to best facilitate active engagement in the generation and completion of those learning routines. Um, just uh, putting in a plug for QLI real quick, you know, everything that we talk about today uh, for, for Anna and I, for, for Steve and, and others is really framed through our mission statement, uh, which is here, deliver life-changing rehabilitation and care, protect dignity, instill purpose and create hope, commit to excellence, right? And so even as clinicians, as, as we're thinking about how do we best serve the individuals that, um, that we're serving with spinal cord injury, it, it comes back to this, right? How do we commit to excellence on a day-to-day -day basis in the way that we're approaching our ongoing learning, um, uh, ultimately to deliver that life-changing rehabilitation and care? How do we interact with the individuals that we're serving, um, ultimately finding ways to protect dignity, to to instill that purpose uh, back into their lives and, and to create hope for them. So uh, just to begin, I want a little bit of audience engagement here. And uh, Steve, I may even start with, with you and Anna in studio, but what is something that you're currently trying to learn or relearn. Go ahead and drop your answers in the chat. 
Um, and we'll, we'll start talking a little bit and then we'll kind of survey a few of the answers that you guys have to this question too. So Anna, what's something that you're currently trying to learn or relearn? I mean, this is a big concept, but, um, my husband and I are expecting our first child together. And so, yay, yay, but there's a lot to learn about that. <laughs> and so trying to read all the books and talk to all the people to, to learn all the things is probably the biggest thing I'm trying to learn right now. It's beautiful. Yeah. I, luckily you have a lot of support for success, I probably do. around QLI and, and other areas of your life. So absolutely. I was just going to say, you know, having an 11 year old now, I feel like I know less about parenting now than I did 11 years ago, but <laughs> Steve, how about you? Uh, golf is always on my list. It's one of those things I don't get to play enough, but I, uh, I do want to get better at it. So it's easy, pretty straightforward. Awesome. I, I'm in the process, Steve, you might laugh at me for this, but, um, how long have I had a part of my sprinkler system oh, broken now? Yeah. yeah. I'm in the process of relearning how to replace a, a, a valve in my sprinkler system. Yeah. Well, YouTube's your, your best friend. Uh, along those lines, I just learned how to cut down trees, grind stumps, the whole, the whole nine yards for you, that. So you I did I, you went I lumberjack. that project urban lumberjack. It, it took me four times as long as the tree company, but mm -hmm. I did it. All right, we got a few here. We got uh, letting go, trying to learn a new machine for sewing projects. Those are uh, pa I saw patients on there as well. Guitar, got a handful in there. Love it. Thank you for participating. Yeah, love it. Um, so just you know, as we think about that question uh, and we dive into some of the content here, think about how long does it take you, uh, or how long is it taking you to pick up those skills? How have you gone about? uh, learning, um, the skill that you, uh, you, you were thinking about and, uh, what, you know, what kind of barriers have popped up along the way that have made it more challenging? Um, you know, again, is this something that you learned a while ago and you're, you're picking up again because life took you in a different direction, um, or other priorities, uh, kind of popped up along the way. I, I think starting there is really, really helpful. Um, so there's two concepts I want to uh, just briefly hit on before we uh, dive into the rest of the content. Uh, one, this quote from Nelson Mandela says, do not judge me by my success. Judge me by how, uh, how many times I fell down and got back up again. And I want to use that just to kind of frame this concept of resiliency. We have, um, you know, we're working with individuals that have had their lives flipped upside down, right? Uh, you've had a spinal cord injury. Uh, there's a lot that's been taken away from you. Um, and, and really it's about how do you respond? Um, and people, have different levels of resiliency, um, you know, based on a lot of different factors in their lives. And uh, you can kind of see that in this, this word thought bubble to the side. Um, when we talk about resiliency, it's that ability to manage those challenges, like Mandela was talking about quickly recovering from them and even growing and improving as a result of these challenges, right? Um, it, it's, you, you can't talk to an individual who's had a spinal cord injury and, and be like, hey, what's the silver lining, right? That's not appropriate. Um, but it is our job to, to influence, to come alongside, to be compassionate, to have empathy and, uh, to really understand, put ourselves in their shoes and to understand what is life like right now? And, and how do I help influence you to take that next step? Right. You have anything to add to that, Anna? No, I think, I think you covered it really well. Yeah. The other concept I want to hit on, uh, then, uh, just to get into it, here's this quote from Ted Lasso, uh, Jason Sudeikis, if if any of you are familiar with Ted Lasso, uh, season one, he says, taking on a challenge is, uh, is a lot like riding a horse. If you're comfortable while you're doing it, you're probably doing it wrong. And I kind of, I love that concept in terms of learning and uh, approaching neuroplasticity, right? A lot of us are probably familiar with neuroplasticity, uh, which really just says that uh, our, our brain, our nervous system has the ability to learn and to change. And I think when, uh, when it comes to a spinal cord injury, um, obviously you may have that initial trauma and we're going to see a lot of recovery, maybe in those first six to 12 months. Oftentimes that gets framed up to, uh, the first couple of years after an injury, but I don't, I don't want to forget about all of the time that comes after those first couple of years, right? Uh, the, the volume or, or the amount of change that happens in those first couple of years is significant, but we can't forget that people can still learn. They can change, they can adapt and the nervous system can do that far beyond those two years as well, right? So when we talk about that neuroplasticity, it's physical, it's cognitive, emotional changes. Um, it's going to require the repetition and practice and routines and learning can either be positive or negative when it comes to that. 
All right. With that said, we're going to dive into the specific learning principles that we talk about. And so at a high level, uh, we've got six components of learning um, that we're going to touch on. And we're going to talk about each one of those at a high level. And then we're going to get into some nitty and gr nitty gritty with, with each of them too. So uh, those six components of learning are motivate with meaning, support for success, identify the interferences, uh, stepping outside of the comfort zone, tying it to the task, and repeat, repeat, repeat. Uh, right? If you're familiar with with uh, motor learning uh, in any way, shape, or form, we've taken a lot of those concepts, uh, not just motor learning, but other practices of learning, and we've we've tried to bring them into a way that um, we can easily communicate those, um, not just with the individuals that we're serving, but we can teach it to one another. We can teach it to all of our team members at, at QLI. Uh, and we really think that these are ways that you can um, maybe easily remember some of those concepts and you can use them in your, your own day-to-day -day as well. So that being said, Anna, can you talk to us about Motivate with Meaning? Yeah, it's probably one of my favorite learning mantras that we teach because it's such an important element. Um, I think think back to the things that you were you guys were listing regarding what you were learning. Hopefully, those things that you listed were meaningful to you because we know that um, the effort put forth, um, the ability to retain and to learn new skill, is a lot better when we have something that we're we're doing that's meaningful to us, and that's a really important concept when. When I'm working with an individual um, with a spinal cord injury, uh, we could work really hard with someone um, that um, we're trying to reteach how to how to cook or to um, or to be in the kitchen and and adapt. Um, but maybe their spouse does all the cleaning and or all the cooking, and um, that's not really an important skill that they want to learn. So they're not going to find that meaningful. They're not going to probably. Um, retain it as well or put as much effort forth versus something else that um, is really meaningful to they want to get back to um, they're gonna they're gonna retain that better and um, it's gonna be a little more conceptualized for them it's awesome so um I, you know I love kind of putting like I talked about earlier putting myself in the individual individual shoes and I finally changed the picture for this presentation it's a new picture right um but I guess I'm gonna throw this question out to you know, you, Anna, you, Steve, here in studio, uh, just look at the picture, right? Um, from the picture, and because you also know me, like, what can you infer from that about what might be meaningful to me? Well, I think knowing you, but also seeing the picture, like, I, we know you are a great outdoorsman. That is where you feel the happiest when you are in the outdoors, when you're hiking with your kids and your family, that that is so important to you. And I think I know that you have yearly camping trips with your family every year. So obviously that's meaningful to you. Yeah. The goal of hitting every state park. I mean, yeah, I think that's what she's talking about, but I, I mean, I would say all the things, but um, I just know that your family is really important to you. And when it comes to priorities, I think um, you're way more meticulous than I am about your priorities and your day-to-day -day schedule. But I know that you prioritize things, but you know, at the top of that list is your family. And then, um, but I think it's not only the hiking, but it's the hiking that you get to do with your family. And I think if you separated those, I don't think there'd be enough as much meaning to you. Yeah. Um, so we'll see how well we know you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that, no, that's great. Um, I was, uh, I was, helping to teach a class recently and and it, it was really exhilarating. It was on the ICF model, <laughs> <laughs> right? So uh, for, for lis listeners, if you're familiar with that, right, it's, um, you know, looking at, uh, you know, different challenges that an individual might have and, and how you address those, right? At one level, uh, you've got body function and structure, which we might refer to as impairment, right? This is ICD-10 language. Next level is activity limitations. Next level is participation restrictions. And that language, you know, is not exhilarating at all, but really what it comes down to is, uh, I love Simon Sinek's book, Start With Why, right? Um, what What's purposeful? What's meaningful? What's, what is your why on a daily basis? And and I look at my my photo here, and uh, really, we're talking about when when we're starting with someone at that participation restriction level or motivated with meaning. What gets me out of bed every day? You guys, you know, hit the nail on the head. If I had a spinal cord injury, what would change for me? Right? I have these roles as husband, as father. I, I love adventure. I love uh, you know, one wanting to go to a lot of the national parks. Uh, check those off the list. This is a 
if we have anyone from Michigan, this is the the UP. This is Lake Superior behind us, and this is um, uh, Picture Rocks uh, uh, National Lakeshore. Uh, just a, a beautiful area. I wouldn't be able to use my body in the same way, right? Um, so there are things, there are roles that I would start missing out on, right? There are opportunities that would change. Um, obviously, I'm I'm able to uh, come to work and use my body every single day as a physical therapist. So from a work related perspective, that's changing. Um, I can't, I can't fully comprehend. I can't fully imagine what that would be like. I agree. Sorry to interrupt. Those of you who are raising your hand, if you have a question, use the Q and A. We can't. Um, there's no uh, back and forth conversation. So use the Q and A, not the chat. Sorry to interrupt you, Brad. We just have a few few folks raising your hand. No, that's okay. And so uh, even as we start with motivate with meaning. Um, as part of this conversation of helping people to acquire new skills after a spinal cord injury, um, put yourself in their shoes, right? Think about that from your own perspective. Um, what would you be missing out on? What, what would you, um, what would you think about as most valuable or most important, uh, as part of your recovery, as part of your rehab process? It's not just about doing a slide board transfer all of a sudden, right? Um, it's about doing that slide board transfer so that maybe you can get to a chair to go do, uh, the things that are most meaningful. Uh, maybe there's a way for me to figure out how to do an accessible hike if I had a spinal cord injury, right? And and making it about that. That's the end goal, not just doing a slide board transfer with the least amount of support, right? All right. So next one we're going to talk about is identify the interferences. Anna, talk to us about that. I think when we think about interferences, we think about what are those things that are barriers that are getting in the way from a learning perspective. And I think we can all think of maybe interferences that we own, we ourselves have. Maybe I didn't get a good night's sleep. Um, I'm really stressed at work. I've got something going on in my family life that that is interfering with my ability to learn or fully participate in life. I think now put your perspective in someone with a spinal cord injury. There's so many interferences that are overlaying um, the ability to learn. We think about the emotional. Um, this is a pretty traumatic event their whole life is being reframed that can get in the way of learning um, physically, obviously their body isn't the same um, and they're really limited in ways um, and having to relearn skill. Um, but then also think about medications um, that could be affecting um, their cognition or um, their alertness, um, financial constraints. Um, if they're not able to earn for their family, that's a huge stressor for them. And so I think we have to overlay all those and understand those interferences so that we can help them best. I think this has gotten better with this population, but I remember when we first opened uh, our doors to the spinal cord injury population, we would get um, some pushback as to why does someone like with that type of injury need the level of support within our program, mm -hmm. right? They don't have a head injury. They can learn very easily. They really just have physical, dif di uh, dis like a physical difficulty of some sort. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, we've come so far to really understand that it's not just if someone has a cognitive deficit, there's a lot of interferences on top of that, that require more repetition and more support and more um, just level of accommodation to that and time to get through that. So I'm, I'm really glad that our, our program has been adopted in that way. And I, we definitely have people who um, have, you know, a small amount of interferences as well as a lar large amount of interferences that come through our program because those individuals need need assistance and they need time and they need all the things that we're talking about. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Anna, you hit on, a, hit on a couple of these, but uh, again, put yourself in these shoes. If you're, if you're trying to learn how to play the guitar, um, uh, but you're taking, let's say muscle relaxants that make you super fatigued or like, um, uh, just feeling out of it a little bit more, right? That's not going to help facilitate your learning process. If you are going through a really stressful phase of your life uh, or some kind of huge transition, not an ideal time to learn something new, right? You're not going to take in that information um, in the same way you would when maybe you're, you're a little bit more healthy, right? Does that make sense? I hate to tell you that once you have your baby, you're going to be really overwhelmed and you're going to, your ability to take in information is going to change just, be mush. just for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> for a hot minute. Yes. Um, oftentimes uh, there could be, you just think about the mechanism of spinal cord injuries, especially, um, you know, a cervical level injury where head and neck are involved. Um, there can certainly be uh, uh, 
mild TBI that's associated with uh, the spinal cord injury that goes undiagnosed that can impact the, the individual's ability to learn. Um, all of those factors around sleep disruption uh, that can happen in the, the hospital setting, the acute rehab setting, our setting. Um, when we're, we're going in, we're giving medications overnight, we're checking, we're doing turns, right? Those things are going to impact um, uh, individual's ability to learn. And uh, what I learned recently in a new way um, at a conference, I uh, was just thinking about uh, especially with a cervical level spinal cord injury where the, the autonomic nervous system is involved, um, you're going to have some dysregulation of, uh, of blood pressure, right? And oftentimes you're dealing with a lower blood pressure in that population of individuals. Um, and chronic low blood pressure, you think about it, you're not saturating the brain with as much blood and oxygen, and you can actually see some changes in cognition and mentation over time. Uh, in those individuals with uh, cervical level spinal cord injury because of chronic low blood pressure. Um, so again, that's just something I'm like, wow, on the front end, we really have to train people to make sure that they're getting up, you know, we're finding ways to bring blood pressure up in some way, shape or form too, through exercise, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then let's just talk about, you know, the complexity of some of the the new skills and routines that people are learning. They go through this, this acute uh, care to inpatient rehab, uh, outpatient rehab, and in and, and the post-hospital setting with us, right? Here's just a, a few of the skills that we're, we're looking at. And uh, it's really easy to just put those in bullet point form on a slide, but then to teach those and the amount of time that it takes to learn those and, and maybe um, tweak that learning process for the folks that we're serving uh, or individualize it to them. Um, it just takes, it takes a while to do all of that. Right. Um, you know, we've all kind of learned how to do a lot of these skills um, on our own over the course of our lifetime. And then to have that apple cart turned over and to relearn how to do them in a completely new way while you're grieving some of the things that you've lost is incredibly challenging. Right. Um, and so uh, obviously it takes a, a team of people uh, to help accomplish a lot of that, which was my perfect segue into our next uh, learning mantra, which is support for success. Yeah, I think, I mean, when we think about interferences, we think about um, what is that support? So me as a clinician, I'm thinking about, I'm teaching um, someone with a spinal cord injury, a uh, slide board transfer. Um, overlaying all of those interferences. Hopefully this is a meaningful skill for them. What is my support? Um, both from a physical standpoint, um, what, how am I, um, educating them? Um, what, what are those words? I don't want to do something that is overwhelming to them. So how am I explaining it in a, in a way that's understanding to them? Um, how are we, how are we building that into their schedule? There's a lot that comes from, um, support standpoint that is really important. And then how are we pulling in those supports outside of just therapy, um, medical staff, how are we pulling their families in to be that support for them as well? Awesome. So, um, you know, I think maybe one, we're going to talk about a number of different things under providing support to help people be successful. But one of those just might be a, a learning preference that people have, right? Can you talk a little bit about just different preferences that individuals uh, may have in the way that they learn? Yeah. And I think I, I usually ask them um, early on what their preferences are. I mean, some people prefer it written out. Um, others are very visual and, and need some sort of video or visual cue to be able to understand it or bringing someone else in, um, that has a spinal cord injury to show them that new skill. Um, and then other times, um, it, it's a combination of a lot of different things. And so understanding what those are, um, even kind of what culturally, um, is important to them or language. Um, there's a lot of elements to that. Obviously, um, if there's a language barrier, we need to be pulling in, um, people to help translate that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think another concept that we can think about is just, are, are we teaching something explicitly or implicitly, right? And in some of those examples, we, we may have people that, let's use slide board transfers as an example again. Um, we may have people that are really going to benefit from like hearing you say explicitly, right? Here are the the three main steps that you need to take in order to complete this transfer, Right. Um, 
and maybe they need to like see you do that too, or they need to see someone else do that. Um, but we may have a lot of other folks that just implicitly by setting up the environment and then repping that out and letting them get a feel for it, they're going to learn a little bit better that way. Right. Yeah. Um, you think about uh, the complexity of the tasks and number of tasks that we're talking about. We can't sit back and explain every single one of those explicitly and, and expect that the folks that we're serving are just going to pick that up. We've got to set up their environment um, and, and maybe do it with them, do it for them, do it with them, do it alongside them, and then give them ownership along the way. But again, they're going to learn from that procedural process implicitly from us setting up that environment and again, kind of doing it step by step like that with them too, right? Yeah. yeah. And then I think beyond that, then how are we scaling back that support as well? I think it's such an important concept. I think um, we can be really heavy with the support early on, but then knowing when to scale that back um, to increase that learning process uh, that will come up in, an, in another element that we'll talk about from the learning mantra. But I think, I think this concept here is also important in thinking about um, it impacts on cognition or memory for folks, right? That So that explicit memory part is really going to require strong memory skills, um, internalizing that and then making something of it. Um, but if we're having struggles with that for whatever reason, whether it's uh, medications that we're taking, it's fatigue, it's um, un undiagnosed you know, mild TBI, or maybe they have a diagnosed mild TBI that came along with spinal cord injury, we, we really might need to hang some of our hats on the implicit learning processes for them, right? Yep. Okay. Um, so then just in terms of support, think about the continuum of care as people are going through. And you can kind of see that arrow on the bottom uh, representing uh, the amount of support that people are going to have uh, along um, the, their course of healthcare delivery, right? A lot of support on that ICU end as they get out into the community, community-based care, that support really um, diminishes as well. Um, I also just want to acknowledge, you know, there may be points in, in their recovery um, going through those levels of care where uh, there's some fluctuation in the, the amount of support that they need. So we have, uh, Steve and I have done a number of presentations on just these, these kind of bridges or transitions that happen between those levels of care or even in an individual's life where um, we've got to find ways to support them in the midst of that to help smooth out the the bumps, right? Would you add anything to that, Steve? I mean, I, I would just, a uh, point of clarification, it can happen in between levels of care, but you you referenced, it could be a point in someone's life. It could be even within the level of care. So I think of it, um, you know, in our setting, we have individuals go from house six, which is the house where they get tons of support. We have our RTs and, and CNA staff around, and then we move them to a simulation apartment, right? That's an inflection point where we would expect to see some level of change and they're probably going to be challenged and they might be a little bit overwhelmed. Um, we all like to use real life examples. So we're going to use your pregnancy as an example, right? She's about to come up on having a baby. That is a time in your life where you're likely going to benefit from some support. Mm -hmm. And we, we can see that coming. So let's prepare for that. So that's why we talk about this concept is a lot of these we can see, hey, in three months, this person is going to need X, Y, Z. So let's prepare for that and just know that it, it might be a little hard. Some people work through it more quickly than others, right? So Anna, she may move through having a baby with a breeze. That's great, but let's make sure the support's there just in case. Um, and and so I think there's a lot of concepts around that that, that can be avoided uh, in terms of challenges if we just look ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and to kind of highlight uh, a couple slides ago, just that arrow uh, of, uh, decreasing support over time. Think about uh, those levels of care, ICU, acute, post-acute. Um, look at this list of individuals that are just kind of present. They're, they're in that place with the individual. That's a lot. That's a lot of touch points around them. Uh, but again, we get into that community-based setting. And uh, ideally, this is what it would look like, right? Where you, you have a good group of of people still around them that are engaged, but in reality, uh, a lot of those are siloed, right? And so um, you're you're not going to have as good of communication, and you you may not have um, you may not have all of those people on board, so they may even have less support, right? 
Uh, so that's something that we need to think about in uh, the care for these people. Amit, you alluded to this um, uh, earlier when you were talking about support for success, but um, you know, some of the keys are like, hey, how do you ultimately, how do you get to those people that are that are around, going to be around them for the rest of their lives, right? Their support system, and um, and and actually start educating them, right? Uh, you know, we have to consider the people that are going to be there day in and day out, um, that are going to be there down the road. And uh, we've got to find ways to start educating them, right? Do you want to talk about just some of the ways that we might um, help support the support system or help educate the support system? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a an element that we try to institute really early on in the process. Um, and just like we're we're training that that patient or that person with the spinal cord injury new skills, we are also teaching those caregivers, those support system um, as well, new skills as well. And so we have to to scale it as well. This this can't be an overwhelming thing. We we need them to to understand and, and relearn the skill. And so how we're doing that, how we are supporting them, is a really big element too. But we're thinking about those people that are going to be with them. Who are those caregivers? Is that a spouse? Is that is that an agency? Is that a friend that's going to be helping with some of these cares? We need to get them pulled into those cares and get hands-on experience from that early on and then um, backing away our support so that they're taking on more pieces. So by the end of the time of discharge, they feel really prepared. Um, I'm thinking about um, employers. Um, if, they, if this is someone that's going back to work, um, how is that employer? How is that um, that work site set up? for success for this person? How do they know? How are they educated about SCI? I mean, most people don't understand all the elements of what's included in spinal cord injury. And, and so how are they educated as well to, to watch out for things as well? We talk about blood pressure and bowel bladder. These are things that are important concepts for, for someone to know if they're working pretty closely with someone. Um, and then, I mean, beyond that, there is touch points. You, you talked about that transition from post-acute to community services, that's such a big piece of how am I connecting with those future providers to make sure that that transition of care goes really smoothly. I know we're going to get to repetition, um, so I don't I don't want to steal your thunder on that, but I think there's a level of repetition that's required. You're talking about early uh, exposure, right? Because the earlier we expose these individuals, the more repetition they get and we can gradually scale it up. So just a plug for that, that's coming. And then, then there's a reason why we include those everyday people because outside of our care, they need the repetition, not only the individuals who are helping, but if they know how to actively do it well, then the individuals we're working with, with the injury, get more repetition too. So just a plug for that. The other thing I would say that, that I think um, we always run into is there's a difference between sharing information with someone, you know, giving them a checklist and giving them the information and then walking alongside them, modeling it for them, watching them do it, and then giving them feedback. And, I, and a lot of times we get the individuals who are, would say, oh yeah, they taught me that when I came from acute rehab, but that meant a lecture in, in, in a presentation hall. Yep. And that's a big difference between having to go home and actually execute it on your own. And so there's a, I, I just think that's a big um, reason that some of our folks do really well, or if we do a poor job of it, they might fail. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a great, great thought, Steve. I was even just thinking about um, when I started working as a physical therapist at QLI, I had someone alongside of me, like showing me the ropes, right? And then I also like, as I was learning everything that I needed to do, I started making checklists for myself. So I wasn't going to miss something along the way. Um, and, uh, and, and would use my calendar for reminders, right? So I had all of these things that I kind of built in to help me have the support that I needed to be successful in that environment. And in the same way, like there's some tangible things up on your screen right now in terms of if we're walking alongside that support system, right? What what kind of written aids do we have for them? Checklists so they know what's going to happen. Um, but beyond that, how much are we doing it with them? And how do we know when to kind of fade that support over time, as you were talking about, Hannah, to, to help them gain the skills that they need, the confidence that they need? in the midst of an over, overwhelming situation uh, to be able to carry that out successfully when they transition back into uh, their own lives as well. Um, I, know, I know we got to get moving. We just had a, a comment about case managers and it's a, it's a great one. 
Uh, I think case managers are a common thread with all the individuals we work with. So making sure that and, and recognizing that it's not just families and friends and employers, it's totally. it's case managers and other medical providers. So Charlene, thanks for mentioning that and, and certainly not trying to exclude anyone. Yeah. You know what? I, I missed that again. Like I, I've said time and time again, I got to get that on this slide and mm -hmm. I missed it. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, absolutely. So um, with that, we're going to shift into tie it to the task, right? So we've covered motivate with meaning. We've always got to start there, right? Yep. Um, and uh, we've covered what are the barriers, what are the interferences? And then uh, we've got to look at um, so the right amount of support for success, right? So now we're going to go into tying it to the task when it comes to uh, acquiring new skills. Yeah. And I think I'm going to use Steve, you as an example. So you said that yeah, I used you as an example. I know. So it's only fair. Um, so you are always perpetually learning um, about golf. Um, I think there's a lot of ways to learn about golf. Um, you could watch videos. Um, you could talk to someone or watch tournaments. Um, you can go out to your backyard, but really the most tangible way and we know this um, about learning any skill is doing it task specifically in that environment mm -hmm. in the way that is closest to how you need to replicate that in your mm -hmm. life. And so um, you can go to your backyard and hit a hundred balls into a net. Um, but is that tangible to actually getting on the course and actually um, having to play different, um, different terrains, mm -hmm. um, different clubs, things like that? Um, makes it a lot more tangible, which makes the, mm -hmm. the learning experience um, much more successful. Yeah, the pressure of standing in front of my buddies while I have to tee off. Mm -hmm. The Ryder Cup's coming up. Think about it. Mm -hmm. those, those guys playing in the Ryder Cup, there's no there's no uh, really any way to simulate that unless you're in it, right? There's a big difference between playing a practice round and going out and playing in front of hundreds of thousands of people and representing your country. So, yeah. And I'm nowhere near that. Um, okay, so just to uh, kick us off here, I'm going to throw a question out to you guys in the audience. What are some tasks that you would expect an individual with a C7 Asia impairment scale B spinal cord injury would be able to learn? Reminder, use the Q&A. Yep, use the Q&A for this. Drop your answers in there. We'll wait for those answers. We'll read some of them off, and then we'll try to incorporate those in. C7 level spinal cord injury, the AIS part, if you're not familiar with that. Um, yeah, Self-cathing. Go ahead, sorry. Yeah, if you're not familiar with that, right, um, an AISB is essentially going to be, they have some return of sensation below their level of injury, um, but no motor. So in this case, with a C7 level injury, that's the normal uh, level of neurological functioning above that. And below that, no motor but a little bit of sensation. In Asia C, you start to get some spillover of motor, um, especially in those sacral regions. And in Asia D, you might have someone that's walking a little bit more. So we have eating, another uh, vote for self-cathing, uh, transfers. Eating's an interesting one. I'm curious what you're all gonna say about that one. Food prep and cooking, slide board transfers, self-cathing, fine motor skills, cooking, bowel programs, independent toileting, feeding. Another vote for catheter using the phone. Oh man, they're teeing this up for you. Wow. You guys are doing awesome. Operating the wheelchair, uh, speaking with technology. So let's, let's go there. Um, Anna, let's talk about a C7 level spinal cord injury. Um, and just in, in light of tying it to the task, if you get that, that individual has a C7 level AISB, um, let's say they're roughly 30 years old. Okay. Okay. Um, in good health prior to that, what, what is your kind of prognosis or the outcome that you're thinking about, uh, six to 12 months down the line for that individual? What, what should they be able to do? Yeah. I mean, I think when a C7 comes in, um, it's, it's kind of that transition where it's, it's an exciting program because I know that they can gain a lot of independence back at that level. Not that you can at, at levels prior, but that C7 is really, um, that element that um, we know that self-transferring um, is going to be a skill that they most likely will be able to learn. Um, so thinking about slide boards or, or popover that um, 
um, that tricep, that C7 kind of level where they're getting that tricep return is a really big element that's going to help with that. Um, I saw mention of self-catheterization. Um, another piece, we know that these individuals are going to have um, upper extremity or hand um, limitations. They're not going to have that kind of that fine motor mm -hmm. um, of their hands, but um, with some adaption tools, I think I saw feeding on there as well. There's a lot we can accomplish from that standpoint too. bed mobility. Um, we're probably looking at more. So if you're talking about a 30 year old, uh, more of that manual chair. So looking at wheelchair skills, how are they getting around yep. complex wheelchair skills, things like that. Yep. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So like you mentioned, triceps are kind of a, a key part of that, right? Um, that's going to allow them to do quite a bit uh, for themselves, um, whether it's propelling a manual wheelchair, um, slide board transfers or popover transfers are going to get a lot easier. So access into vehicle type of vehicle that they need, breaking down the wheelchair. Um, there's a lot of skills to teach that type of an individual, right? Um, and uh, so so then it comes to, we have all of these skills and they've listed out a lot of them. Self, Self-cathing uh, can be done, bowel program, like, um, uh, you know, inserting, um, things anally or is, is going to be a lot easier at that level, right? Might need some adaptive tools to do that. Um, uh, the type of equipment that you're going to need in a shower. Now, some of that, just because of the deconditioning that can happen early on after that spinal cord injury, some of that is going to take some time to recover, right? So that person may end up in a power wheelchair initially, but your goal should be getting them to a manual wheelchair. Mm -hmm. um, how do you start tying some of those skills to specific tasks, right? It's not just about strengthening. And I, I hopefully teed you up on this with motivate with meaning earlier in the conversation, but maybe talk about that for us. I know. I think it is really important to know who that person is, what gets them out of bed, what is meaningful to them. Cause whenever we're working on these skills, they're hard things. Like these aren't, these aren't easy things that they're learning and they can be frustrating at times. And so being able to tie it back to, gosh, you really love your job. You want to get back to work you're going to be able to, you need to be able to do these skills. You need to be able to get yourself out of bed and get yourself ready to get to that job. Or um, you love being outdoors. You want to get back to camping. Let's figure out how you're going to self-transfer yourself down to the ground um, to be able to sleep in a tent with your family again. Um, so finding that meaning point is a big element of that. Um, and then just thinking about how are we building that into their day? Um, from a, from a training perspective, we're obviously starting that with with clinicians, but it can't stop there. Mm -hmm. um, we have to be transferring this into the residential setting. We need to be pulling in the, um, we call them RTs or CNAs um, to be transferring these skills so that they're getting it um, throughout their day. They're not just getting, and I, I um, we'll talk about repeat, 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 but um, they're not getting five repetitions in a PT session. They're getting um, tens, hundreds of, of repetitions throughout their day. That's going to really help with that learning process. Um, so, and then pulling in family. Um, if someone really wants to do car transfers, okay, let's teach family how to do car transfers. So on the weekends, they're getting off campus and they're they're getting out into the community. Um, so kind of pulling in all the supports as well. Yeah, so, you know, uh, real world environments, you hit on this a little bit, like it's one thing to say, okay, today we're gonna work on an uneven surface transfer, right? Um, don't go do that on the therapy mat go out to a vehicle that's similar to what they they might uh, be needing to get into and work on that uneven transfer there, right? Or gosh, they're really motivated to um, get back outside, right? Adventure. Um, what would it look like to do kind of a step down transfer into a kayak in, a, in the adaptive sports area, right? So thinking about how do I take that skill and how do I make it meaningful is a big key to tying it to the specific task, right? Mm -hmm. Good. Um, all right. So let's dive into stepping just outside the comfort zone. Yeah. Um, I think when we think about intensity and complexity, this is kind of the overarching that, that comfort zone element where we need to find that sweet spot. We can't be pushing someone too far out of their comfort zone that they're going to failure. They're going to give up. They're going to get frustrated. Um, but we can't also be, have it be too easy because um, they're not they're not going to be um, acquiring that skill or they're not going to be moving forward and gaining more independence with that. So we got to find that sweet spot. And, and that's understanding the person, um, developing a relationship with them to know kind of where that spot is. 
Awesome. So I just have some really like kind of tangible things to to think about that, right? So if we're thinking about a specific sil- skill and getting them just outside of their comfort zone, not too far out, right? Um, one, it takes it takes some skill to understand what does that process look like. We've got to to be able to identify and assess that particular skill. Where are they at? Take a snapshot of where are they currently at, and and that way you kind of know as as the support person, you know, what's what's maybe that next little step that we've got to give them a nudge into. You've got to develop that plan and implement it with them. Um, you've got to be able to monitor and modify that. And you've got to train the people around them as well to be able to have a similar mindset to keep them moving forward. Um, and so just kind of tangibly, right, we're, we're looking at, um, again, I'm coming back to slide board transfer again. Uh, but if, if we're going to identify that skill, um, we've got to make it uh, tangible and meaningful to them. So it's not just about doing a slide board transfer because they need to do a slide board transfer so they can be more independent. It's about, Hey, if you're able to do this, like that opens up a lot of opportunities for you. It it takes away the need for people helping you. And it gives you back some of that control in your life. Maybe it allows you to get into a vehicle again, which opens up you know, a lot of the world to us being able to get from point A to point B. Uh, hey, this this allows you to get down into that kayak again and get back out on the water like you wanted to. Um, and so identifying what those specific uh, goals would be in the routines. And then, like I said, taking that snapshot, assessing where they're currently at and being able to develop a plan uh, to kind of move them forward. You know, it's always helpful. I, I know it's helpful for me. Like if if I'm wanting to, let's say, grow in the work setting, right? It's helpful for me to to talk to my mentors and say, "Hey, listen, this this is where I'm at, but like, I, I need I need a little bit more of a vision. Like, help me cast that vision so I kind of know what those next tangible steps are." In the same way, if we're just stuck in the here and now and not necessarily painting that vision or casting that vision for them, uh, talking out loud about it continually. It's hard for for the folks that we're serving to know, like, why am I doing this now? So tie it to that bigger task, like we talked about, and and really open up that vision for them. Anything you want to add to that? No, I think that's good. Okay. Um, and then ultimately, we've, we've got to implement that plan. And I love how you were talking about just um, having uh, having touch points with all of our team members, right? So, uh, and I think for for those of you listening, right, if you're working with, uh, if you're a case manager and you have a, a patient that you're working with in another program, these are things that you should be looking for. Like how well, um, how many repetitions, uh, again, we'll get to that. How many repetitions does this person get during the day because people have taken the time to train other team members and and um, find creative ways to to really open up um, uh, ways for the the person to get outside of their comfort zone on a regular basis, because again, that's what kind of challenges them and helps them uh, take those steps to get to the next level. Because there's a constant modification that has to happen. You're not gonna you're not gonna be static in the same place. It's it's going to be dynamic, and you have to have skilled people that are um, constantly kind of monitoring and modifying what's happening because that target's going to move, right? Where the comfort zone is, is going to move over time. And uh, it's going to continually do that. Okay. All right. We've talked enough about repeat, repeat, repeat. Now we're actually going to get into it. Anna, why don't you tell us a little bit more about this? Yeah. I feel like this is um, a concept that we can all really understand. Well, we know we need high repetition um, for anything that we're learning. Um, Think back to to kind of that, that thing that you're learning about how many repetitions do you need to be able to acquire that skill? Um, Gosh, I know golf. I don't, I mean, the amount of repetitions that you need to be good at and the consistency with Mm -hmm. that um, is, is really important. So same with our individuals when we're, we're teaching the skill Um, and to your point, Brad, this can't be done just in um, a physical therapy setting. We we just aren't going to get the repetitions in an hour setting or an hour session to be able to get the right amount of repetitions um, for this skill. And so, we have to be transferring that to throughout their day. Um, how are we building this in um, so that by the end, they're getting so many repetitions that it is becoming that more implicit learning. It's not so explicit. They're not even having to think about it anymore. Yeah. And and some of this, I think, is just tying back to what we were talking about with support for success too, right? Um, being able to, to train the people that are going to be around them. Uh, Because that's going to happen in the rehab setting, but then what does it look like beyond those two years that we talked about earlier? Um, How do you how do you give people the tools so that they can continue doing that 
far beyond their time in rehab, right? That should be our entire goal is that we're transferring our knowledge. We're transferring what we know to the individual and to their families so it can continue on. Yeah, we say this a lot that these components of learning are are pretty easy to understand, but they're not all that easy to actually execute. Mm. Uh, and as you start to look at them, they're all, they all build on each other. So I'm even thinking back, you all talked about tie it to the task and comfort zone. Those are completely tied to each other. And then as we start talking about repeat, 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 we've again mentioned that multiple times. So organizationally, and even with our families and, and support system for these individuals, it's making sure that they understand the value of a repetition. You can't miss one throughout the day, not one. Uh, because if we see how valuable they are, then we understand that those add up and stack up over time. And so we talk a lot about people understand repetition is important. That's pretty much a no brainer. It's how do you maximize the repetition? And then how do you make it easy for the person to do it? Uh, because that ends up being one of the barriers is oh, I don't have enough time or I forgot or whatever the case may be. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to throw up um, the CEU. Don't throw up. No, 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 I'm not going to do that. I'm going to throw up the CEU information again. And Steve has a poll question that he's going to launch here um, for you guys. That's a, that's a wrap on our presentation. Um, but as you guys, Steve, you can maybe go through this again, um, launch that poll question. But as you're doing that, if you guys have any questions, we'd love uh, those questions to maybe pop up or Steve, maybe you can review some of those and we can answer them while, uh, while we have some remaining time here too. All right, here's the poll question. So just make sure to answer this and, and this will show up for us after the fact. And then while we're doing poll, let's see if we got any, uh, Cindy Linton, we got your message about where to send uh, the PowerPoint. Uh, any other questions while we're wrapping up here? Just while we're um, waiting for everyone to to weigh in, we'll let the poll question stay up just a little while longer. Um, just tie a bow on all of this. If, if, if you're listening to this and you have someone with a spinal cord injury or you have maybe someone in mind, uh, we've talked about all the mantras um, and, and decision-making between the different levels of the continuum. What are just some things to just process? How, how, how do we... Uh, what's what's one big takeaway for the group to go implement after this in your mind? Loaded question. Ready? Go. Very loaded question, Steve. Um, yeah, obviously. So there's uh, very specific things that um, individuals with spinal cord injuries need to learn, um, but those also vary based on level of injury, um, completeness of the injury too. And so I think as you're engaging with um, programs that are working with spinal cord injury, um, you know, you probably need to gauge like what, what is, how, how good is that understanding? What opportunities are available to them? Um, education really does matter. Again, I think if we're, if we're thinking about, um, uh, uh, developing and acquiring those, those skills after spinal cord injury, uh, as clinicians, we've got to know that information really well, and we have to know the resources available to people in their communities too, uh, in order to not just teach them in the moment and help them acquire those skills within a rehab setting, but also to get connected to a larger community, right? Mm -hmm. To get reconnected back into their lives again. Um, that, you know, I, I kind of have this image in my mind of, you know, there's some, there's some kind of like 
trauma that happens. And then there's a, a rehabilitation process that happens from there. Uh, but beyond that, then we're talking about development of that person, developing them back into those roles of their family, of their community, uh, maybe the workplace again, uh, or a new workplace. And uh, it takes that strong team early on in that rehab setting to really make that happen. And I think in order to make all of that happen, you've got to build a, a good relationship pretty quickly with that individual. Um, and so you start with motivate with meaning. Well, and I love your, we didn't really talk about this, but the value of community. Mm -hmm. We see this a lot. Um, you, you might even be able to talk about what some of the things we're doing with our motor learning program and the value of that. We're even doing some things around campus and understanding that, you know, because of where we sit in the continuum, we're at the post-acute level and we're sending people back into the community. And oftentimes their community is just fragmented for various reasons. Either they haven't been there for a while or socially, it's really hard to reintegrate. And then they built this like community here in Omaha and like, how do we bridge that gap? Mm -hmm. So I love the fact that you brought in community and we didn't really talk about that. So I know that was, that was actually what I was going to mention was just that, that mentorship and seeing someone like them is, is such an element that is so important that I, that I hope is not getting missed um, within the acute post-acute even beyond um, because we can teach a lot of skill um, and we can add a lot of value but if they don't have that community to kind of fall back on, that's that's like them. That um, I think that's just such a meaningful element um, that um, I, I hope isn't forgotten because I think you need that community to continue to, as you said, it doesn't stop at two years. Mm -hmm. um, this, this neuroplasticity, this learning, this creating community goes beyond that. And so I think you need individuals that have gone through it to be able to be examples to someone yep. to kind of take them on their wing and kind of show them um, what, what's possible. Yeah, I think that's a big part of, we were, we were talking about vision casting, right? Um, kind of under that, just outside of the comfort zone. Well, you, you have to kind of have a vision for what life can look like um, to keep taking those steps and to move that comfort zone out mm -hmm. too. And I, that's a great example, Anna, of just how do you how do you show them someone that's doing life that is thriving and not just surviving um and uh yeah create create a vision of what it could look like right yeah, yeah just a couple more things to add these mantras that that Brad and Anna referenced we use them as a checklist so if you have someone who's struggling or even who's doing well refer to the mantras and figure out where there's opportunity and then you reference this too the only thing i would add is uh, we, we we view learning and recovery as a lifelong process and making sure that wherever this person is at within their recovery, uh, that that we support them and we provide opportunities to continue to learn and grow. And it's the environment that we create. It's the community that we create. It's the opportunities that that we give or, or that the person takes advantage of. So uh, lots of good stuff. Thank you so much, uh, both of you, for joining us today. Uh, one last thing on the Q, uh, on the CEUs, they are CCM certified. So uh, unfortunately not for adjusters. I should have mentioned that at the very beginning, uh, but we kept you on the line anyways, if you're an adjuster. Uh, but again, uh, thanks for filling out the, the uh, poll question. Uh, we will be sending uh, the evaluation uh, following this, fill that out, and then you'll get your CEUs and the presentation slides via email. Uh, so we will be back next month. Uh, so we look forward to having those of you uh, interested in, in our topics joining us again. And, and for those who are new and, and who are repeat uh, joiners, thanks again for uh, being with us today.